فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الإمام الأوزاعي رحمه الله told us something very powerful about fasting he said ليس يوزن لهم ولا يكال إنما يغرف إنما يغرف إنما يغرف لهم غرفا الإمام الأوزاعي إمام أهل الشام he said fasting is not scaled for them nor is it weighed for them so it's not measured for them and it is not scaled for them but it is given to them in a large portion the word gharf means what? when something is just taken from a place without it being looked at how much it is it's just take it no, this is all yours, take it no weight is looked at and measurement fasting when it is given is given without no measurement and without no scaling it is given unrestrictedly also this hadith tells us Two times the person who is fasting will be happy. Ikhwani, look. Happiness comes with obedience. Wallahi. Two times. Lissaimi farhatani. The person who is fasting twice is happy. Farhatun inda fitrihi. When he breaks his fast, he's happy. Wa fitra. And he is also happy. Wa farhatun inda liqa'i rabbi. And he's also happy when he meets his Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason is because both of the times have one thing in common. One is that this ibadah is over today. So he's happy, he accomplished something today. But pay, pay attention. Brothers, pay attention. When you finish an ibadah, you are in love of Allah. You're not going to be happy to, for that ibadah to be over, another, another ibadah not coming. So you can't wait for the next one. And that's what Allah said to the Prophet. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ when you finish ibadah, go into another one. He didn't say, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ When you finish ibadah, فَذْهَبْ Go. فَانْصَبْ means get your head down to another one. So when a person breaks a fast, he knows another one's waiting for him. And then another one's waiting for him. And that happiness, because wallahi brothers, love drives, drives. It drives a person. Have you not seen a person who's madly in love of somebody? He loves them so much. He loves them excessively. His heart is into this person. And because of that love he has for that person, what does he do? He takes measurements and he takes distances that a normal person won't. Sah? The man who said, Uqabbilu dal jidari. Wadal jidari. Wadal jidari. Wadal jidari. I kissed this wall, and I kissed this wall, and I kissed this wall. It's not out of love for the wall which I am kissing it. I'm kissing it because of a woman who I used to love used to reside in this wall. The crazy thing is it makes you do. صح? You see a big man who never cries, crying so much. Buckets. Akhi, why? I love my wife. Because of maybe a divorce issue that's happening. Yeah? You see the brother leave his car keys, the car's switched on, the keys are still inside, the engine is on. He just walks away, he goes home, and he's stressed, the mind's gone. Sahih? One of the things that love does to you is that it makes you a slave for that thing. Sahih? Some people, because of their love for some woman, are you with me, brothers? They will leave the religion. They're ready to leave the religion for it. Sah? I have a sister who once called me. She said, she, it's a long story, but it's a non Muslim man that she met and she fell in love with him and now she's ready to leave Islam. You know how it started off, brothers? I have to tell you this story because it's one of the Minal Gharaib. It's one of the shocking emails and the sh- shocking conversation I've ever had. This girl met a guy. First year of university, she said, I didn't like him. I didn't like, and she said, I, I didn't like him not because I was pious. Uh, taqwa or iman that wasn't the reason she said she, the real reason is because he wasn't attractive to me and it wasn't appealing so she said I ignored him I told him leave me alone stop talking to me leave me alone so first year went over second year and she said but he wouldn't leave me every time he would come to me in the library when I'm there he'll come in the canteen he will also come he'll always want to talk to me I just leave me alone I'll leave he'll still do the same so the first year went f- finished the second year the same thing happened he kept coming he kept coming kept coming wouldn't let go and I think, I, I'm not sure, did she say the second year or the third year, one of the years she said he came 
This time he worked out. He spent a couple of weeks and months in the gym. Big hands or big arms. Next, big. She said, Subhanallah, when I saw him, mind boggled. Lost of words. Gobsmacked. She said, Subhanallah. I said, What's your name, brother? He told me his name. We took numbers, we spoke. We took it from the Alif. And she said, Now, Subhanallah, I can't see my life without him. She said, There's a problem, brother. She said, we've done everything, haram, you can say we've done it. There's a problem, brother. What's the issue? He's not a Muslim. Hey, I can't see my life without him. Hey, yeah. So I don't know what to do. And he said to her, pay attention. Sister, have I? She every time comes up to him and says, say, take Islam. She's not trying to give him da'wah. So she's telling him to take Islam. And he's like, I'm not taking Islam. I don't want to be a Muslim. She's like, please take Islam. We can get married. I can take you to my family. And we can make this official. He's like, I don't want to take Islam. I like you to be a Muslim and I want to be a Christian. Or whatever he believes. He's like, can I ask you a question? This is, this is it, subhanAllah. Can I ask you a question? He said to her, can I ask you a question? How is it that you are always telling me about Islam and you want to force it down my throat? And I've never ever come up to you and told you to become a Christian. Why is your religion so... If your religion is confident in itself and it believes in itself, then why is it we Christians can marry any people of any religion? Why are you Muslims are just all strict like this? Brothers, the sisters now saying, Brother Wallahi, I'm questioning Islam. I really want to know why would Islam do that? If it's she's now her issue is niqash with the religion. Why, brothers? So the person who's being questioned at times like this, and people are putting fatawat to you like this, don't answer a question because it's, don't answer the sub branches of the question. You look at the fundamental element of this question and the source of where it's coming from. Sahih. Are you with me, brothers? If you keep, keep focusing on sub-branches and things like that, then you're not going to get nowhere. The fundamental reason is this brother. She loves him. Sahih. And brothers, my point is, that's what it does. And I know many of you guys know stories like that, situations like that. You've heard of somebody, you know somebody... Somebody knows you. You've heard cases like that. Brothers, when Allah is in your heart, Ibn al-Taymiyyah said, you have no one else in your heart. Your heart is preoccupied. Look at that same brother. Who's, he, he, he divorces his wife. Pay attention. A brother loves his wife so much. They go separate ways. They divorce each other. And say to him, whilst the first couple of days, say, Akhi, I've got a sister for you. Get married. What would he say to you? A brother is excessively in love with a woman. He, they go separate ways. What does he say to you? Ne next day you say, you, you divorced her. Alhamdulillah. Now I've got a wife, I've got a, a sister for you. You want to get married? What does he say to you? But let's answer the question. Why? Because she's full, now she's taken the heart. He says, two people can't be in there, brothers. There's no shirk in love. Sir? So, there's already somebody there. Somebody's occupied the heart. That's how the believer is when it comes to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. Allah is already there. There's nothing else. There's no room for anybody else. Is it now clear now to you guys? That's why the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he felt pain or suffering or agony or something in worldly issues, whatever it may be, the Prophet would say, Ya Bilal, arihna bisalah. Bilal, give us comfort in the prayer. He's reached that level, ladda. He enjoys it. You, me, we see the salah as a taklif, as a burden. You're like, what is Maghrib? What time? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. 45 minutes from now, Maghrib. And I have to pray. Wallahi, the salahs are coming so close to each other. They're just coming closer and closer, man. You, you find it a burden. You find it? You find it. That's why I asked the brothers, Wallahi, I think, inshallah, ta'ala, if I live, there's a book that should be read. This book profound Profound Brothers This book Your bottom jaw will drop This book has to be given time to And I've said it many years ago before, In this place That book is Shaitan. 
اللهفان في مصايد الشيطان written by ابن القيم مي my years of learning this book I have not seen the likes of it I haven't when it comes to dealing with the problems and the heart and the issues related to it and the effects that it has on all these points that I'm saying unprecedented Ajib the way he goes into it Ibn Qayyim and how he points out these points that book if you know the Arabic language and you can understand the Arabic language if you don't know Arabic language if you don't know Arabic language just learn it for that book Huh? After the Quran, of course. Learn it from that book. Just so you can understand. The gems and the jewels in those book, in that book. Wallahi. No. But there's a point I need to mention before you read. And that is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wala khuluf. I mean, Allah said, Wala khulufu. Some people read it as what? Wala khaluf. They read it as a fatha on makhaf. And that's an incorrect pronunciation of it. It's an incorrect, it's a lahm, incorrect mistake that many people mention. Qadr Iyad, rahimahullah, Ibn Hajar al Asqalaniyu, and others, they mention it. That it is not with a fatha on the kha, but it's what? Khuluf. Khuluf is what? It's the change of the odor of the mouth. Huwa tagayru fil fami. When the mouth, the odor changes. But brothers, pay attention. What does it mean that the smell of the person's mouth when they are fasting is more beloved to Allah? So does that mean we can't use, use miswak? Because if Allah loves this smell, then you shouldn't use miswak. Some people say that. We're going to come to a chapter later, inshallah ta'ala, of the issue. The scholars, they say that the smell of the mouth is not this dunya. So when you're fasting and your breath doesn't smell nice, don't put it in the people's faces and breathe in the people's faces. And they say, Allah <laughs> I've seen people do that. Uh, he breathes on your neck. Yeah? And he says to you, Wala khulufu Especially if he's a shafi'i. And they take the opinion, they take the opinion that you can't use the miswak uh, the zawal. After the zidith, you can't take, you can't take the miswak, you can't brush. So after duhur onwards, they don't use miswak. And of course, after door to Makhrib, how much is left? Sah. Anyways, the person should use a miswak. In the morning, use your miswak, you're allowed to. And also use Colgate and MacLeans or whatever you use. Huh? Use Colgate or Aquafresh. You're allowed to use it even when you're, when you're fasting. So this hadith, that's what it shows us. But the thing that it smells nice is the day of judgment. Just like the martyr, the shaheed. The day of judgment, what did the Prophet say? That the blood that gushes from the from martyr is what? The blood that gushes from the martyr. What is it? The day of judgment. Yeah? is more beloved to Allah. And it's better than the smell of a... Naam. But brothers, if you're fasting... This hadith says to you, shahwatahu. You leave off your desires, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, Man lam zuri. Anyone who doesn't leave off false testimony, and implementing it, and I think we're going to come to this, right? فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ فِي أَنْ يَطْعَ طَعَامَ وَشَرَابَ Brothers, if you're making, you're, you're insulting people, if you're sitting there, you're backbiting all day, if you're sitting there, you're just talk, you're gossiping, if, brothers, you're not doing khayr, Allah does, and, you're, and all you think fasting is about is leaving off food and drink, Allah doesn't want that fasting from you. Allah has no need from you. The question that arises right now is the hadith mentions that they leave off their desires, right? And a lot of us desire sleeping, right? We love sleeping. Oh, I love you guys. Yeah, I love fasting right now. Why? Because I sleep all day. <laughs> Sahih. So, can we say that sleeping is haram because of the hadith? يَدَعُ شَهْوَتَهُ He leaves off his desires. Sahih. And it's everybody's desire and everybody's passion to fall asleep, right? So can we say that it enters that one? Brothers, talk to me. It's not a rhetorical question, are you? The 
it's a different thing. The qiyam and everything that awaits you. Nah, good point. So the qaylula you say now. So he's saying it's sleeping between the door and it might even be a sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ. Good point. Are you? Any other points? Shawa here means jima'ah. And that's the strongest opinion. That the desires in this specifically, this hadith is actually meant only by intimacy. And now when we say intimacy, we mean everything that... Brothers, pay attention. I don't want to be specific. And allow hib. But you, you know what I mean. Any way of fulfilling your desires sexually. Are you with me? Any way of fulfilling your desires sexually. falls under this it's a, sex, it's a sexual activity are you with me that breaks your fasting so it's like eating the fasting breaks now if a pairs I don't like using these words I, these terminologies that many people use especially how uh, sins when they're mentioned brothers it's not nice to mention every sin by name it's not good manners the sharia when he talked about intimacy always spoke about it indirectly so Allah Taala He says, "Nisaukum harthu lakum fatu harthakum." Your wife are like your tilth. Come to them as you, as you wish. So He doesn't say to you intimacy. لذلك أولا مستم النساء لمس. It's touching. See, I refer to when you touch your wives. ولذلك what did Maryam say? ولم يمسسني بشر. Nobody touched me. صح. This vulgar usage of language. It's not nice. Sharia, there's what's known as kinaya, kinaya, kinaya. And many people, they love to use bulk language. Ah, dangerous, it's not nice. But any, f- pay attention, I want to focus. Any form of releasing yourself sexually is haram. But the question arises that if a person does it in that way, are they going to have to come with a kafara, just like if they were to have intimacy? Sah? Intimacy, there's an expiation connected to it. We're going to see it later, inshallah ta'ala. So if a person, met and goes into the room, does something wrong, and they sexually fulfill themselves, are they going to have to do expiation, just like jima'ah? There's a khilaf amongst the scholars. No, that is haram. And your fasting does break. But the question here is that, is there is a kafara or not? The strongest, inshallah ta'ala, is that there's no kafara on that person. Are you there? Except... If the person is being told to do the kafara min babil wiqaya to prevent him from it, a deterrent, sah? If we know that there's no other way for him to stop except to be told this is a kaf- then it will we'll, be used. Other than that, it's not on him. Huh? It's not on him. So, brothers, really understand what fasting. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Having a wet dream, that's not you bringing it. If you have a wet dream whilst you're fasting, even if you had intimacy with your wife, your night, your wife the night before, and you still didn't do ghusl, and then fasting comes in, there's nothing upon you. You just have to just do ghusl. Does that make sense? The Prophet used to do that, alayhi salatu wasalam. But the intimacy had to happen when? Huh? Are you with me, brothers? Now, that issue of watching something haram, whether it be privately in your own in your own place, or whether it be outside, that's a shahwa, that's haram, Ramadan, and outside Ramadan. A lot of those people, if you look at them, Allah, and this is one question you need to ask yourself. If you were to, some of the things that you do privately, if a person you respect in the community was to see you do this, your mom, your dad, the local sheikh of the masjid, the brothers who you're with, you're practicing with. If they saw you right now, what would they think of you? You wouldn't like them to see you do this. Why do you make Allah the lowest of the ones who look at you? Why do you make Allah ahwanun nadirina ilayk? 
Allah says in the Quran, يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَلَا يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مَعْهُمْ إِذْ يُبَيِّتُونَ مَا لَا يَرْضَى مِنَ الْقَوْلِ They hide it from the people, but they don't hide it when Allah is the one who can see you. I think that ayah alone should move a person, should move you. That I have actually become so devilish and so evil that I have made Allah the lowest of those who look at me. That I will respect a human being from not seeing me do this. But I would make sure that Allah wa ta'ala sees me. That itself is a deficiency that's serious. Sah. Now I'm not saying, say, okay, since I've shown it to Allah, I'm going to show it to everybody. That's, that's not what I'm saying to you. What I'm saying to you is very dangerous what you're doing. Are you with me, brothers? Very? It's very dangerous. Walidalika, brothers, this issue is one of the actions that your righteous deeds all get nullified by doing things privately and you're not scared of Allah. The Prophet told us in the hadith, a group of people are going to come the day of judgment. Hasanat, they come with righteous deeds. Kajibali Tuhama, the Prophet said, is as big as the mountain of Tihama. Like nothing existed. Like they did nothing. Allah nullifies all their righteous deeds. So the Sahabas were shocked when they heard that. They thought, okay, who are these people? They said, Ya Rasulullah, are there, aren't those people Muslims? Because they know that the believers' actions get nullified. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَىٰ مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلِي فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْ ثُورًا The disbelievers, all the good they do. Like for example, Bill Gates, for example, the richest guy in the world, if he got, went and gave charity to all of Africa and said, all of Africa, this is my money to you guys. The day of judgment, Allah will say, you've done nothing. Because his kufr takes it away. But Allah is not unjust. He will still give him good life, good Joy in this world. Allah will reward him. But there's nothing for him in the hereafter. So the Sahabas, Ridwanullahi alayhim, Ajma'in were like, Ya Rasulullah, they're not Muslims, right? The Prophet said, No, they're Muslim. They're your brothers. Pay attention to this. Ya Sumuna Kamata Sumuna. They fast the way you guys fast. Wa Yusalluna and they pray, Kamata Salluna, like the way you pray. Like you pray. Pay attention to this. Walahumul Havdu min al layl. Even at night time, Qiyamul Layl, they have a portion. So they're even better than many people who do this in, the, in these sins. These people are Qiyamul Layl, Qiyamul Layl. Sahabas were shocked. Walahum, and they have Hadd min al The Prophet then tells them the reason, the underlining reason. He says, Walakinahum, but Ida khalaw bi maharimi lahin tahakuha. This is the underlining problem. When they are by themselves, the sin that comes to their mind, that's it. They go in. They fulfill that sin privately. They don't worry about Allah wa Taala and that which Allah wa Taala looks at and what Allah thinks of him and whatnot. Doesn't care. And because of that, their righteous deed got nullified. Are you with me, brothers? Walakinahum, but they were. وَلَكِنَّهُمْ إِذَا خَلَوْا بِمَحَارِمِ اللَّهِ انتهكوها. Sheikh Abdul Kareem Al-Khudair, my beloved teacher, he bought a phone. He bought a... And he said, I bought a smartphone. I questioned him this personally. He's bought a smartphone. He said, when I bought the smartphone, one day he was using the phone, and pop, a woman came up. She closed it. For him, the woman is just one that's not wearing hijab. Normal, right? That's how it is for us, right? Women's door, right? Hijab, stuck, Allah. Hey, yeah. That's how we are. Wallahi, look what he did. Wallahi, look at when Iman is full in your heart and it's strong. Inshallah, wa narudullah, we hope Allah from him like that. He took the phone and he got rid of it. And he said, I got rid of the smartphone and I bought a dumb phone. I'm telling you as he said it. When he bought the dumb phone, he said, I use it. I said to him, Sheikh, why would you do that for me? And I told him all the benefits that are in this phone. I'm talking about myself. Allah, this phone does a lot for me. That sometimes I lose a book. I don't have it. But I, mashallah, I saved it. Saved things on here. I listen to driving. I listen to so much durus, lessons. They, this phone, subhanAllah. It does a lot of khair for me. But he said something to me. I knew it. But the application and the way he said it, it just it baffled me. He said to me, Abdul Rahman.
He said to me, Repelling the evil takes precedence over bringing any good. Repelling the evil takes precedence before you can start thinking of getting any good. Get rid of the evil first. Then think about what good it can come. So he said, I got rid of it. He said, I need to call, I can for. I need to ring, I got it. If we re- Look what he did. He chose between his place in Jannah and his rudiyah, his servitude, then a phone for a couple of years of his life. 16 to 70 years, you're going to live for, not more than that. Little go over 70, by the way, the Prophet said. For those years of your life, you're going to live in this dunya. Are you going to disobey Allah wa ta'ala? And brothers, looking is a sahmun min sihamu iblis. Wallahi, these two eyes. It's an arrow from, of iblis. That's where he gets you. That's where he gets you. Nobody goes and commits zina without having to check out what they're going to do. صح? And the sharia, my beloved brothers and sisters, when, we get, when I get phone calls and people ask me questions, you're, you've called me a bit too late. Because our religion doesn't work like that. Our religion is not about solving problems. It's about preventing problems. That's the underlying factor of Islam. Islam is about prevention. This country is it about prevention. I'm not talking about the prevent scheme that they have against the Muslims. I'm talking about prevention. Are you allowed to hit your child? No. Can you shout at your child? No. Can you tell him off? Really? No. It's all child abuse. Child abuse is a big word they use now. They'll take your child away from you. Sahih? Unless you take them to Pakistan and you do what you want. Sah. Then when the child robs a bank, what have you just done to me? You've taken away all the means away from me. Sahih? What have you done to me? You've prevented me from all the Uruk and the means to prevent my child from becoming this criminal, becoming this type of person in community, in society. You didn't let me do it. And now he's become a wolf in society. It's causing harm. But what is it that they did to me? Are you there? Brothers, pay attention. Are you there? They tell the people freedom of choice and freedom of... You say freedom, freedom, everything. And then he does something crazy and you say, whoa, 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 what happened here? You told him freedom. Sharia is not like that. The Sharia is about what? Saddu dharaih. It closes of doors from far. So before the people, so the problem doesn't happen. It blocks it off far from far. So protect your eyes. The reason why you're falling into these sins is because you're not protecting your eyes. Just protect your eyes, protect your fingers, your tongue and everything. And then of course, inshallah ta'ala, Allah will protect the rest for you. There are two things that destroy a nation. There are shahawat and shubuhat. Desires and what? Doubts. Desires and what? Doubt. May Allah protect us from shahawat and may Allah protect us from shubuhat.